Well, my, my experience was brief. It was 1973, Christmas time, and circumstances, different things that I was trying to do. I ended up in Los Angeles at that time. So the people I was visiting, on Sunday they took me to Calvary Chapel. I didn't know anything about the Jesus Movement, didn't know anything about what was going on during those years. I was not aware of a lot of things because I was just this missionary kid that had come up from Brazil to go to college. So I went there without any knowledge about anything. Yeah. You know, I found out later a little bit more about it. But uh, So on this Sunday morning I went in and, and I encountered a new type of church because I wasn't, I was a Baptist, you know, the yeah. straight kind. And, and this place was set up like an amphitheater. And there was a band up front playing music and they led the worship service. So that was all new to me. And it seemed really, back in the terms of those days, cool. You know? Yeah. And, and I was impressed. We were called to hug each other, and you know, we we're all sitting on these. They're not pews. They're like amphitheater seats. Yeah. yeah. Amphitheater seats. They were they were nice seats. They had you know armrests and everything. Yeah. Padded. But we stood up and we all hugged each other and. and we sat back down, and it was it was neat, but I, it didn't affect me too much. I don't know exactly why. I was going through a few things in my life at that time. Yeah. And then I just went back to college, you know. I went back to Tennessee where I was going to college. Yeah. But I was what I was going through back then was what do I do with my life? What was I going to do? I, I had given my life, surrendered to the God of heaven as I knew him. And I said, what am I going to do with my life? And that question remained with me for quite a while. You know, so anyway, that was my small experience with the Jesus movement. It was Chuck Smith's original church, I found out later. Really? Wow. And Chuck Smith, of course, plays a, a huge role in this upcoming movie, mm -hmm. uh, The Jesus Revolution. Mm -hmm. And the other figure, of course, is Lonnie Frisbee, yeah. who's a Jesus-like character, mm -hmm. and you know, big beard, long hair, yeah. which was kind of characteristic of the Jesus movement. Yeah. A lot of them were hippie-type people. But uh, anyway, those are things I found out much later. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so it's a starting comment on the on the movement. Uh, yeah. Most of what I know about the movement now is what I've learned more recently. Hmm. I was not really tied into it much. Yeah. So you weren't even so much aware of a Jesus movement. You just happened to go to a church during that time mm -hmm. in the right place. Yeah, it was it was a strange coincidence actually yeah, yeah. that I even got near Chuck Smith's church. I mean, it's yeah. like I'm going, oh, what? Why in the world did I end up there? Mm -hmm. Just the family I was with just happened to take me there. Wow. So, <clears throat> how about you, Hawk? Um, in 1973, I was living in South Florida in Boca Raton. Uh, I graduated from college. Uh, I was married. I was living down there, and in my experience uh, during college, um, I pretty much. Um, Gave up on the American dream and followed the footsteps of those who were being radicalized in a certain way. And um, I became a hippie during those years. And so in 73, um, my wife and I were pursuing our, our dreams uh, down in Florida. And through a series of events, I started to read the Bible, uh, the, the New Testament. And before that, in university, I, I, really, um, I really learned some things that really sealed in me a real doubt about the validity, the validity of the Bible 
uh, about who Jesus was, um, those types of things. So this is where I was coming from. And now I actually read a book that was written by one of the Jesus movement, I guess, evangelists. Uh, his name was Hal Lindsey. He wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And my Aunt Betty had given me that book years before, and I never read it. And for some reason in Florida, I decided to pick it up and look at it and see what was in it. So I did. And the thing that really got my attention was that he was able to document what the ancient Hebrew prophets said that had come true in history. And all that was documented in the book. And so it made me start to believe that these Hebrew prophets were connected to something higher than just human existence. And, and because it was undeniable that the things they said came true because it was documented in the secular history. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I don't, I don't know about everything else, but somehow these men were really connected and maybe the God of Israel was, maybe there's something really real about that. So this opened up my heart really for the first time as an adult to the possibility of something in the, that the, at least that what those prophets said was real. But I didn't know anything and I wasn't, I wasn't really a, a Bible student or anything like that. But I did, but, and because of that I picked up the Hal Lindsey book. Mm. <clears throat> and um, I believed in what Hal Lindsey said there and then I read another book that he wrote so this led me into reading the New Testament and my wife and I used to go on our days off we'd go down to the beach in Boca and we'd sit on the beach and, and I, I would read the Bible to her in, in the New Testament and I read I was reading things that Jesus said and one day we were down there and I read something I can't really remember exactly what it was but it was a way that he was commanding his disciples to live and I read it to my wife and I stopped and I said and I pointed to it and I said I want to be like that I want to be like that I want to live like that I want to have a heart like that and she said so do I and we looked at each other, and I said, where in the world are we going to find people that are actually doing what he said? And my wife says to me, I don't know. And so I didn't really know it then, but really what was going on in my heart allowed our father to release his angels to start helping me. You know, and then later on, of course, I learned that he gives help to those that are going to inherit salvation. So in the course of events, a time, a very short period of time after that, we made our way back to Tennessee. And, um, and we were actually looking for people um, that really believed in Jesus and had that heart to want to do what he said. And somehow in us, I don't even know how maybe from my, my, my elusive dream of the 60s movement that really we had become disillusioned in, I thought that maybe if people really had this kind of love, they would be able to live together. So if there was really something to people that really took seriously the words that Jesus said, that maybe there were people somewhere that actually lived together and actually loved each other. So you never read that in the Bible. You just no, I just thought that since the yeah. you know, like, well, sin, uh, G, you know, Jesus or Yahshua and his disciples, they were like a band of disciples around him. Yeah, and I knew where that from, where he went, they followed, and and yeah. it was yeah. I mean, they were everywhere, so they were like a moving community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I knew that from Sunday school. You know, like I grew up in Chattanooga. In the, in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Mm -hmm. You went to church and five-year Sunday school attendance buttons that you, you know they give you. 
where I didn't miss one Sunday in five years. Wow, we didn't and, uh, get those in Catholic school. It's pretty amazing. But anyway, so we went back to Chattanooga, and through a course of events, we were, and I started asking people, you know, do you know anybody here in town that lo really loves Jesus? And maybe they live together. And so that's when I found out about the Vine House. Hmm. And, uh, and he said, yeah, they have rap sessions on Tuesday and Bible studies on Thursday. And it happened to be Tuesday. And he said, you ought to go down there and just check it out. Check these people out. And I said, okay, we will. So we went down there. And uh, we walked in to the Vine House. And the place was packed with people, young people sitting on the floor, sitting around the room. It was in a big house and, uh, and there was a spool table in the middle that was covered with leather and a nail keg with a cushion on it. And there was this, this fella sitting on that nail keg Looked like he was in his 30s and, uh, or something like that. And he was talking to all these young people. And there were some people that sang songs and, and it was kind of interesting. And as time went on that night, I realized that these people had something I'd never seen before. Just the way they interacted with the one that was teaching them and the way they were with each other was really intriguing to me. And I don't know, all I know is, is that by the end of that meeting that night, I had this sense that these were the people that I needed to be with. But I wasn't sure what was going on because I thought maybe the man that was sitting there on that nail cave was just some youth pastor somewhere. And all that he was really gonna say to these people was, well, we've had a really wonderful time, wonderful fellowship this evening, but just make sure you go to church on Sunday. And that, that would, was kind of what he was doing, but I didn't really know. So when the whole thing was over and everybody stood up and people were coming up to me and my wife and, and in the midst of that, I went up to, to this man and it was Gene Spriggs. And um, I walked up to him and I said, can you live here? That was a question. Can you live here? And to my surprise, he said, yes, you can live here. We all live together here. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And I said, I said, well, I think that I would like to move in with y'all. And he said, well, we're really full right now. We don't really have any room and we need another house. And I said, are you sure you don't have anything? Like nothing, like just some place somewhere. And he said, well, on the third floor of the Agape house, there's some attic apartments up there. And the only thing that's really available is a walk-in closet. And we have a bunch of stuff that is stored in this closet, but I'm sure we can move that out and you can move in there. It's big enough for a bed, a table, and maybe a dresser or something. But you know, there's no windows in that closet. Um, but I guess we could do that. And I said, we'll take it. <laughs> and the next day we moved in. And that was like 50 years ago. But that was my beginning thing. And it's like, they, it was real informal. And um, in those early days, there was no real connection. I didn't really, at that time, I didn't make any connection that these people were a part of the Jesus movement. I'd heard about it in California. Um, but I didn't pay much attention to that because it was Christianity. Yeah. So, but I knew these people had love. Yeah. And that's all that really mattered to me, that they had love. And they showed it. And you could tell that they were toward others yeah. and uh, it was really refreshing it was just something like it just got a hold of me and my wife and that's how we started out we just started out and 
What year was that? And that was in nineteen in the spring of nineteen seventy four when we uh, moved into the spring Spain. of seventy four. The spring of nineteen seventy four. And when was it that you came to Ohio? Well, I met I met those the ones that I the sent ones that I met were that was seventy four also. Wow, that's when I met them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, the very. After I met more of them, that was exactly what I saw. It's the very same thing. Yeah. An enthusiastic love for each other. Yeah. It wasn't just kind of a love for each other, but they yeah. were enthusiastic. And, you know, that's, that caught my attention right away. I yeah. said, that's what I'm not, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I could see it. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to be that way. I wanted yeah. to be enthusiastic about the love that I had, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Which I didn't have at the time, but I wanted it, you know, so. So I, rem- I remember that night in the Vine House, that first night. <clears throat> I remember talking to people there, <clears throat> and they were trying to get to know us, you know, and we had told them that we had moved up from Florida and that, and that I was a carpenter of sorts, and we had a pickup truck, and, you know, we were married, and they got pretty excited about me saying that. And I didn't know why they got so excited about that. But then I found out that they had been praying for a married couple and a pickup truck and a carpenter. Wow. And so really we were an answer to prayer. But I thought they were kind of weird because they got so happy (laughs) about this story, you know, these random people that showed up at their house, you know. But it was really really quite interesting. But that night I told them, I said, listen, I just want to ask you all one question. I want to know how you got to be the way you are. It's like the way you are and the way you are all are with each other and the enthusiasm you have about about Jesus. You know, I just whatever it is, I don't have it because I'm not that way. And I don't know how to be that way. And I've heard the doctrines. I grew up going to church. I know all those doctrines about salvation and all that, about Jesus. But So I don't really want to hear the doctrines. I want to hear how is it that you got to be the way you are, that you have what you have in your heart toward one another. And somehow it was the love that they had that caused me to give weight to their words. Because if I'd have walked in there and I didn't sense that they had love for each other in the way that they were with each other, I wouldn't have wanted to hear what they had to say. But because of what I sensed that they actually, I could see it being demonstrated and coming toward me with a lot of of genuineness, just a tremendous amount of genuineness and heartfelt appreciation that we were even there. You know, and like, and I knew they had to be connected to something greater than just what I was used to, which was living for myself and just pursuing my own dreams. They had something much greater than that. And so it really did open me up to the gospel they had, that they had received from that man that was sitting on that nail keg that night. And... So that's what launched me into this, to the life, you know, and that was 50 years ago. Wow. Yeah. So that was the beginning. You know, and as we went along, you know, we found out that, that Gene Spriggs, like, he didn't, he didn't, he was not making some bold claims about anything. You know, I just discovered that really the whole general feeling was that we were Christians and that somehow maybe we just had a little bit more conviction or zeal than people that went to church on Sunday. And so this, the whole direction back then was to find a church where we could interact with people that went to church. And so we started going to church every Sunday and on Wednesday night and just trying to integrate with these people and very quickly when we would interact with them and we would just explain how we love Jesus and like we would say, 
He's worth giving up our whole life for him. All we want to do is live for him. And we found that these people got very threatened by us, by where we were at. And it was very bewildering. It was perplexing, very perplexing. That's how we started. We did not start out with any thought of anything other than that. We just wanted to be a part. And the way we were, we thought that everybody that believed in Jesus should be that way. We didn't know why they wouldn't want to be that way. And so it was kind of shocking and surprising when we found a lot of defensiveness and like, you know, of people really like, I don't even know how to explain it, but we knew there was something different. We just started seeing more and more that there was something different. Hmm. But we still had no real understanding or connection to the Jesus movement. But we started understanding that Gene Spriggs had been in California and he moved yeah, during in, that time. During that time that <clears throat> that you know that, that movie's about. He was out there during that time and he was like going back and forth between different groups all up and down, you know, the coast of California. And and he started talking to us about his experiences out there. And how he, somehow he never really like felt like that what he saw and what he experienced with those people was something that he could attach himself to. And, uh, yeah. But we didn't, couldn't put anything together about this. It wasn't like some big something where we had some big judgment or anything like that. It was just like perplexing, bewildering thing like what's going on with us you know and it just seemed like the people had a hard time with it and then I remember thinking so are we doing something wrong and then I would say wait a minute all we're doing is loving God with all of our heart and we've given up our life to follow him and somehow that love that we have for God is flowing over into how we are with each other and I remember saying to myself What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. And it was like a revelation, like, because all these people, pastors and people, as people got to know us, you know, it was really kind of strange, you know, that they wouldn't wholeheartedly agree with what we were doing. And want to really hear what we had to say about how it was that we could live that way. I thought people would have the same question I had. How do you how do you do this? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So anyway, that was early days in the Vine House experiences for me. And just kind of a very superficial introduction to what the Jesus movement really was and knowing that 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 Gene had been out there among those people during those years. Hmm. So at first there wasn't necessarily a uh understanding but an acknowledgement that there was somehow Gene couldn't mesh in with those people yeah yeah but still considered them brothers there was just somehow yeah. like this isn't what our fathers wanted to do through my life or something like yeah it seemed that way like yeah it was, it was hard for you know, as time went on uh, it was hard for us to understand what happened to the movement yeah. And why did it just get reabsorbed into normal church going? Because the movement seemed full of zeal and full of love from a, a superficially looking at it, you know, looking back in, in time also, it looks like, wow, this, we were like that too. Mm -hmm. But the direction it went into, it just got right back into the churches and into the pews. Now, the reason I say that is because most Christians go to church on Sunday, and they go to church on Wednesday nights, many, I mean the Baptists do, that's prayer meeting night. And then there's the church on Sunday, and then the rest of the time, it's don't go to church, you live your life. You know? mm -hmm. And so it seems like it went back to that, which was something that at the time everybody was reacting to. Mm -hmm. 
there was maybe that's the, the very problem <clears throat> but the basis was a maybe it was a reaction I don't know I know the hippie movement was a reaction mm -hmm. the reason the hippie movement movement disappeared there was no authority no nothing to gather the people and direct them there was uh, no real purpose except their purpose their foundation was reacting to the norm the, the man you know the, the society quo. the the people that they were against yeah. Yeah. and so that had that didn't last long mm -hmm. it all went back people had to okay what are we going to do now oh we got to face life we got to get a job got to earn money mm -hmm. or, or live off of welfare what are we going to do mm -hmm. and so they they scattered the movement didn't continue. Similarly, in some way, there wasn't a direction for the Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. I know I read up on Lonnie Frisbee, and it seems like Lonnie was able to establish something like 19 communal houses around the Los Angeles area. And then throughout the country, there was like 100,000 people that were involved in communes and, and different establishments that somehow he was involved in or involved in creating. Yeah. But then when he faded out of the out of the picture, then yeah. it seems like over a period of time everything faded. Yeah. And everybody just mm -hmm. ended up either back in the pews or or maybe unbelieving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like you, they said, What happened? Mm -hmm. you know, where is God? You know, where yeah. is Jesus? You know? And they ended up right back where they were. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I really know all this, but it's what it seems like. Yeah. yeah. I remember, um, I remember uh, a slogan that came out of the Jesus movement in California, um, and it was something like this: "It was, um, it was like a call. The Jesus movement was a call to get back to radical Christianity." in the first century and they were saying things like that yeah but hmm. you never saw it materialize you yeah. know it never really or at least a lasting fruit yeah well, well maybe you could maybe you could look at it this way that they formed communes yeah and we know that in communes there's a there's an intimacy there's a closeness in living together yeah mm -hmm. And there was even a book called Living Together in a World Falling Apart. Mm -hmm. And when you start interacting, living with each other, yeah. there has to be some, some super natural power to keep mm -hmm. you from getting angry at each other yeah. and getting irritated mm -hmm. and all these other things that happen when people get close. Yeah. Yeah. So that in itself would mean that that people were living together but they were still selfish yeah mm -hmm. so that one quality of discipleship that you know of you know, mark eight thirty four, if you're going to follow me deny yourself pick yeah. up the cross daily and follow yeah and so if you don't do that if you if you're not if you're still living for yourself and you try to live together with other people it just doesn't work. Yeah. Mm. It's self-destructive. Mm. Yeah. I want to talk about that. I am um, so obviously wasn't alive during this movement, but when I first became a Christian about 4 years ago, I somehow found all of this documented. I found like uh Keith Green and Lonnie Frisbee and I actually read uh Lonnie Frisbee's autobiographies and there's something really in my heart that was stirred by it and I wanted to see it happen again, but Somehow it should be obvious, but in looking at it and seeing that it really, I couldn't find what it produced today, you know, only 50 years later, it fizzled out. The fact that the fruit didn't last should have spoke something to me, but somehow mm -hmm. it doesn't. It's like that initial spark, which is really what this movie is probably going to do for a lot of people. It's going to give them this hope, but... You know, what's that quote about those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it sort mm -hmm. of thing. And so I just want to talk about how we've been talking a lot about John twelve twenty four through 26 and how our master mm -hmm. said, unless a seed goes down in the ground and dies, it remains alone. And so we've been talking about how 
Lonnie Frisbee and Chuck Smith, who are two of you know the central characters to this movement, even with just the sh- rest of their lives together actually diverted from each other. They actually ended up alone from one another. Alienated. Yeah. And so we were hearing about how the central part of the gospel that has been lost, which is really the gospel, is Mark 8.34, picking up your cross, denying yourself, and also going into the ground and dying. So if y'all could just talk about that, because that seems to be really Mm -hmm. why we've continued to bear fruit, whereas that movement sort of dissipated like Mm -hmm. many others have. Yeah, well, you know, human beings were created in the image of God in his exact likeness and really the purpose that the creator had for that was that was that divinity could live in humanity but then in the first two people that he created Adam and Eve uh, they came under another persuasion and they were deceived and that's where self-concern and self-life is the persuasion they came under, which is tied to pride, the pride of life, you know, my own life and what I can do with my life. And and this is a fatal flaw. And like this is really what the essence of sin is, is self-life. And so it's because of that, that's why people can't live together. That's why they can't do it. And so without without true salvation. When, so in other words, the, the call of the gospel to give up your life is full of purpose. Because unless you do that, you're going to live from that old life unless you die. Unless you give up your self-centered life. And that's what's supposed to happen if a person is truly a believer and they're baptized into Messiah they become a new creation which means a new heart and the Holy Spirit is poured out in that heart because that person obeyed the gospel and gave up their life which is the very essence of those verses Hmm. Uh, like a seed that goes in the ground and dies I think this camera went out Sorry. Would you rather me not say something that happens again? Or? No. No, as in don't say anything. You can say whatever you want. Okay. Everything's out of here. Thirty-eight minutes. Doing good. Great. I knew it's going to get better at the end. It's just I can feel the. You can feel the energy. <laughs> so, how does one die? How does one go into the ground? How does one deny themselves and die? Because, you know, a lot of people here could probably hear are going to hear what you just said and think, okay, I've been baptized and now I live for Jesus. You know, I tell people about Him. I read my Bible. I like, you know. Stop doing certain things I used to do. I, uh, you know, I, I tithe or you know, I try to give my life onto God. So, what is it? What What's really the fullness of that message? Well, you know, there has to be a, there has to be an environment for love to grow. There has to be an environment for that. And so, if you if the love of God's been poured out in your heart, you're going to do what the people in the early church did. It'll be the same fruit. Yeah. It'll be the exact same fruit if that same gospel is what you heard and responded to. And that fruit was is that all of the believers were together and they had all things in common. In other words, that right there created the environment where people could live for others. And so living for yourself is the fatal flaw of sin. And so if you've really been forgiven for your sins, washed clean, and died in the waters of baptism, and really 
let go of all your dreams and ambitions of what you want to do with your life and turn toward what God wants you to do, which is to love Him with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and to love your neighbor. And even as Joshua said in John 13, the new commandment, John 13, 34, the new commandment was this, that we are to love each other the way he loved us, which was he gave, he laid down his life for us. So if you've died to yourself, you can start laying down your life for other people mm -hmm. all the time. Serving them. Serving, and that's how you serve him. And that's what brings glory to him. And that's what builds other people up because you're living for them and not for yourself. Hmm. That's... Yeah, but it, you know, it started with, with sent ones. Mm -hmm. This is something that, coming from my background, sent ones were... As a Baptist. Yeah, the Baptists, they were eliminated mm -hmm. by a, a, what they call dispensationalist theology. There are no apostles. They're missionaries but no apostles. Missionaries don't have the authority that apostles do because missionaries send themselves in, in a peculiar way. They, they think, well, this is God's will for my life and they go and, and they evangelize. You might say they're evangelists, but an apostle from the word, the Greek word, apostello, means to send. Mm -hmm. So these men that um, our master sent were sent by his authority. Mm -hmm. So he says there in Matthew, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he says, well, in verse 18, he says, all authority was granted me, all authority in heaven and earth. Then he turns to the disciples saying this, he says, you go and make disciples. So he's taking that authority and he's delegating it to them to make disciples to teach them to obey, obey all the things that he taught them. Mm -hmm. And that's the same kind of apostleship that Paul had. And there were other apostles. Not mentioned. Uh, not mentioned. Yeah. But somehow in the mind of evangelicals, the apostles were eliminated at some point. In I think 1 Corinthians 13, there's a, verse there that says this will prophecy will stop and this will stop and that will stop oh yeah everything will cease except love yeah and somehow they weave that into a, a theology that yeah. eliminates apostles well if you eliminate apostles you eliminate the church mm -hmm. because they're the the church is founded on the apostles and prophets mm -hmm. you can read that right there Ephesians 2 20 yeah it's founded on, on their authority because they were sent once Mm -hmm. And there has to be more sent ones, yeah. many sent ones, many apostles for the establishment of communities that belong to the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. It's all about the kingdom of God. It's, there's a misinterpretation about the church, yeah. you know, church being this over here. That's not the church. Whatever it is, it's not the church. The church is a community where people share all things because that's mm -hmm. the nature of of the love that the disciples are commanded to have. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the nature of love to share all things, yeah. to be surrendered, to lay down your life for your brothers. Mm -hmm. You can't even know you've passed from death to life unless you lay down your life for your brothers. Mm -hmm. First John three sixteen, right? We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. So we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And then John, 1 John 3, 14 says, In this way we'll know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. Mm -hmm. Further on he says, uh, I think in verse 19 or 18, he says, uh, we, by this we know we are of the truth because we love indeed in truth. Mm -hmm. So it's not that anybody possesses all the truth, but if you are of the truth and you love the truth, and you'll be loving your brothers, laying down your life for them. Mm -hmm. So that's the nature of the, of the love that he poured inside of our hearts. You know, it's Romans 5.5. 5. He says he poured this kind of love into our hearts. Love that we are to love one another with. 
And if that love doesn't exist, then real salvation isn't there. Yeah. The kingdom of God isn't there. Yeah. That authority. What is a kingdom but a king in his dominion? Mm. What is a head without a body? So the head is the king, and yeah. the body is his people. Yeah. Right. Just as it's described in 1 Corinthians 12. Mm -hmm. So that's what, what we came into. We found that, mm -hmm. that authority. And the love that it produces, or you could say love produces authority. Like a father to his children, like a man to his wife, that kind mm -hmm. of authority. Mm. It's a loving authority. Mm -hmm. So that's what we found, and that's why we're still here. Mm. And that's what we want to see go throughout the whole universe, mm -hmm. this vast, unending universe. At a certain point in time, um, we realized that our Master Yahshua said some pretty astounding things um, about the spirit of Elijah. And, and of course, it's very clear in the Bible that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to um, make straight the path and to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so, um, Yahshua said that, um, he said that in the last days, in the last days that I think the way he said it was Elijah has come and he will come to restore all things. And so what does that mean? That he's going to come to restore all things and so because we're trying to figure out like what is this? You know, where, where is the precedent for what's going on with us. Where did it come from? And then we realize it came from Yahshua himself prophesying that in the latter days that our Father was going to send the spirit of Elijah and that spirit was going to come upon a people to restore everything that was established by Yahshua and his apostles in the first century. To bring it all back so that in the end there could be a witness of the kingdom yeah. of the rule of Yahweh in Yahshua through his people yeah. that the world could yeah. see the character of God in a people <laughs> yeah. the love and unity that defines who Elohim is he is love and he is one, the hmm. God of Israel. And so therefore yeah, Father let them be one. Father Even let them be one. I, uh, That's right. Yeah. And y'all should have prayed this. Go, go on no, no, I was just oh, one thing I was thinking about. Doesn't our master say that if anyone wills to come after me, he must first take up his cross, deny himself and follow me? Yeah. I believe he says that. Yeah. And so kind of what we've been talking about is the first thing has been taken out of the, of the gospel. gospel. Right. That's right. And so you have all these, you know, zealous Christian groups throughout history proclaiming revival and proclaiming uh, awakening, things like this. So they're trying to revive, but we're talking about restoration. Yeah. And so you can't revive something that's not alive in the first place. And so if the first step of the gospel which is to deny yourself which w really what we're talking about mm -hmm. isn't there that's the first thing that had to be restored mm -hmm. so if y'all can talk about that, that that seems to be what really brought the divergence mm -hmm. well that's what i didn't realize when i first came in that what i was actually touching there was actually the beginning of that restoration because that aspect was not left out of the gospel and the gospel you heard. The gospel I heard. Yeah. The gospel that I heard when I came in the vine house was very clear that the main thing about it was that you were giving up your life because Yahshua was worthy to follow. And it, in the way that I heard it was, he's worth giving everything up for. Yeah. For the fact, for what he did for you. 
then that has to like, that has to be fleshed out and it has to become a reality, a way where people can like live for him, you know, and become like him and love the way he loved, you know, and grow up to be a bride that's compatible with him and can rule and reign with him in the, in the coming age. And so this, this is the foundation that we all came up on is somehow that fruit has continued to wax and to grow. And the love and unity has gotten stronger and stronger. And we've understood more and more about who we are as a people and what God's people, what is God's people and who are they and how do they define themselves? And where is, how does that authority work? in those people. So many things have come from that that have caused us to grow and expand. Yeah. And then we look around and we see that all these groups that were starting up at the same time, it just seemed like that, that maybe our father was sowing a lot of seeds in these leaders of these different groups from the Jesus movement. But seemingly, there was only one of those seeds that went in the ground and died, and that was Gene Spriggs. He actually gave up his life, and so our Father could entrust to him his life and his spirit and use him as a vessel to bring about the restoration of all things in these latter days that we're living in right now to begin to form something that could grow into a light to the world, yeah. to be a witness of the kingdom, for the whole world to see, that all nations would see it. Yeah. And this is and we're living for that because we want him to come back. Yeah. And we know that he said in Matthew twenty four, fourteen, the end is not going to come until that witness is bright and clear to the nations of the world. Mm-hmm. So as we as we go on with this and and this life goes down into successive generations, it's like this is all there is to live for. It's to see an end to this age ruled by Satan and the ushering in of our Master Yahshua's reign on earth with his bride, an age of peace for a thousand years where Satan is bound and where the life of this planet is governed by love. And there's nothing in our minds and hearts and what we put into our children there's nothing else worth living for. Once you hear this and you you see it and you're called to it, and you don't want anything else. Just to make a distinction there, uh, in Matthew twenty four fourteen, it's the gospel of the kingdom preached or proclaimed as a witness. Right. And so if you if you say the gospel, you might be talking about another gospel. Yeah. Right. It's it was a little reference to that in. Mm-hmm. Second Corinthians 11, right? Yeah. There he says, what if a person comes preaching another gospel that, yeah. that we, didn't we didn't preach, preach. to you? Yeah. Or, an, or another Jesus, another Yahshua that we didn't, we didn't or another spirit. Mm-hmm. He says, and you're, you're just accepting it. You're just, you bear it well. You know, these, the Corinthians were. Mm-hmm. But that's when you take the gospel and you take an element out of it, it's not the gospel anymore. Mm-hmm. It's another gospel. Yeah. So that element, Mark eight thirty four, was taken out of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it there is no there is no direction, no authority. Take backing up a little bit. Here here we're in Acts chapter two, and these Israelites were all gathered there listening to the preaching of the apostles, mm-hmm. upon whom the Holy Spirit, the set, set apart Spirit of the God of Heaven, was upon them, and they were mm-hmm. preaching or proclaiming or prophesying. Mm-hmm. And they get convicted. They said, okay, man, we, we, we killed the Messiah. Their Messiah. They killed him. They crucified him. Mm-hmm. So they're pierced to the heart. So then they say, brothers, talking to the sent ones, what do we do? Mm-hmm. What do we do? So going in, they, he says, Peter answers and says, repent. Turn your back on your old life. Mm-hmm. Repent means turning your back on whatever it was you were doing, you know, your whole mm-hmm. life actually. 
Yeah. Go to the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins, or meaning wash away all the sins that accumulated are accumulated in your conscience. And then receive the gift of the, of the set-apart spirit. Holy means set-apart, yeah. the Holy Spirit. So what you have is it's a life for life. Mm -hmm. In baptism, you die. You give up your old life. Mm -hmm. That's when, in, 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 a, a, in a very real way, you go under the water and you leave your old life behind, right there. You mm -hmm. bury it. And you come out to a new life that you receive, mm -hmm. which is the Holy Spirit. He pours out love in your heart. That's what he does. He pours out love in your heart. And the evidence of all this is unity. The unity of love. So that's why our master prayed. He said, Father, let them be one that the world would know that you sent me. Mm -hmm. It's like an authentication, a, mm -hmm. a way of authenticating his ministry. The world will know. Because true unity is a unity of love. It's a unity of service. It's a unity of care. Mm -hmm. It's a unity of these people under the government of God, mm -hmm. under the headship of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. under the headship of Messiah, whose spirit is in that body. Yeah. And it doesn't come any other way. Yeah. It's total surren surrender. Your whole life is surrendered there. Mm -hmm. And if it was any other way, then it's compromised. It's a different gospel. And then he gives that whole body of people a purpose. It's to bring about the end of the age. Why in the world would he say, and then the end will come? Mm -hmm. In Matthew 24, 14. Right. He says, when the gospel of this king over his dominion, you know, kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed to all the earth, then the end will come. Yeah. Now, I don't know what end he was he talking about. He's talking about the end of this age. Yeah. It goes way back to the story that Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the statue yeah. and that stone that rolls down and destroys this. That's the end. That's the end of the kingdoms and nations of this society, this age. The world system. Yeah. yeah the end of it. So, Can we talk a little bit about what the government of God and like what a kingdom like demystify what the kingdom of God is because when, when we're talking about apostles I was considering two things how what gives someone the right to say they have apostolic authority we were hearing about 1 Corinthians 9 recently how Paul said people even considered him a false apostle but it was the fruit that his life produced in the people you said it and then on the other spectrum there's also a lot of people out there today calling themselves apostles and prophets mm -hmm. and evangelists, but they're not actually vitally connected nor mm -hmm. submitted to one another. Mm -hmm. So if you can just talk about that. Like, you, know, you know, if a, if a person uh, has that authority from God and they're sent, they're sent from God, then it's going to bear the same fruit that it bore in the first century. Yeah. And so our Master Yahshua there was some kind of discussion with, with his disciples about how you would judge a true prophet from a false prophet. And he said, you'll know them by their fruit. So what is the fruit? It's Matthew 7. And so if a person is sent from God and the spirit that he's talking about is upon them, they have that authority, the authority that comes from glory. Glory is ruling power. That's what it is. Inner self-worth that you have. And it comes out in ruling power. The ruling power of love. And people hear that and they follow it. They believe it and they submit to it and they follow it. And it's all based on love and a response to love. And it bears fruit. And the fruit that you can see written in the book of Acts is the fruit that that spirit and that authority will produce every single time. So in these last days, the restoration of all things will bring about that same fruit. So if you look around and you look at people that proclaim to be apostles, you have to look at the fruit. What's the fruit? 
And so the fruit is not just uh, a bunch of people that um, were like a denomination that has a bunch of different churches all over the place because they're really divided from the other denominations. And that's the fruit. And so what happened to the so-called Jesus movement? What's the fruit? They either don't exist, they don't exist anymore, they broke apart, or else they became a denomination. And like, and, you know, I just want to say this as a fact. I'm not trying to throw stones or anything, but I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have a community there. We started there. And some years ago, a Calvary Chapel church came to Chattanooga. And I have a friend who goes to Calvary Chapel that I talk to from time to time. And he has no idea about the things that I talk about and about the fruit that I talk about. And he's under the spirit that really just allows him to go to church once a week to a service, and then he has his own life. And so that's Calvary Chapel. That's the fruit. It's people that have their own life and they go to church. And really, the way they came into existence in the organized denominations was dividing over doctrine. And so that gets into a whole other realm about you know, what was the birth of Christianity? Yeah. And was the birth of Christianity, was that really like the body of Messiah? Or was it the fruit of when the body, when the love that was, that formed the body of Messiah waned mm. to the point where the spirit of love didn't live there anymore? Yeah. So that's a big question that people have to answer in their own heart. You know, I can't answer that for people. But everybody's got to really understand what Yahshua said about fruit. The fruit of the kingdom. The fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. So, so we want to see the fruit of the kingdom grow into a fire and a great light that really justifies who God is and what He's like. Because people have all these different versions of who he is and what he's like. Hmm. Different gospels, different spirits, different Jesuses, like you said before. Yeah. That produced many different versions of him. Yeah. When he said, Here Yahshua said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Yeah. And so that's not some ecumenical spirit. That's a life together. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, this is a dense subject, but I wonder if we can touch on prophetically what the church is as far as like going all the way back to Abraham and him being the father of faith and that the body Messiah is actually a nation. Mm. I think, was it First Peter 2, 9? It says it's a nation. You know? yeah. mm. It's a holy nation. It's a priesthood. Yeah. Mm. It's a lot of things. But most Christians wouldn't think of the church as being the nation because there's a dispensationalist theology that came in and yeah. says, "Okay, we're not, we're not Israel. Yeah. We're the church. Yeah. We're kind of special. Mm. We're in a, a dispensation of the church age, which is symbolic of the, there's a fish involved and yeah. was, you know, something like that. Yeah. But, um, but." That kind of thinking, it uh, there may be some little merits to it somewhere, but that kind of thinking takes away from what Peter's really trying to say there in First Peter two nine, mm -hmm. and there's other places that talk about it. Yeah, that were the ones who inherit the promises, that were sons of Abraham through faith. Many other things, uh, many other things are spoken about it, and divorcing. The, the church from being the nation of Israel is, 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 is like something very strange. 
Mm -hmm. It's very strange. It's God's purpose has always been the same from mm -hmm. the beginning. Yeah. Okay, we're in the age of the new covenant. Okay, that's a different dispensation. Okay, maybe so. But it doesn't take away the fact that he's always wanted a nation. And if mm -hmm. you look forward into the future, into the book of Revelations, you see 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. You see a nation of 12 tribes. The so holy city is represented Brian. with 12 gates. Yeah. And the holy city represents the church. Mm -hmm. So when our master came and walked upon this planet, the, one of the th things that he did is he gathered his first disciples and then he appointed 12. Right. Now why 12? He Later on he says, you're going to all sit on the 12 thrones and judge each the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. So he had 12 in mind. It wasn't just a sort of a, oh yeah, 12 is a good number, I'm just going to show yeah. 12 disciples. It's clear that were for the sons of Jacob. Mm -hmm. The Israel was to be one, a, a nation of 12 tribes, just like James 1.1 1, 1 says. Mm -hmm. yeah. James, is, you can't be writing to the Israelites, the, Isra the Jews, the Jews were something different, you know. Mm -hmm. They had their own religion formed in Babylon. Right. But the Jew, he, wasn't, he wasn't writing to the Jews, he was writing to the 12 tribes. What 12 right. tribes? Mm -hmm. There were no 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. Well, there were. There was 12 apostles. There was 12, 12 spiritual tribes being formed at the time. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, most people don't know anything about it. Yeah. And they also don't, they don't go back to really understanding like that um, <laughs> the faith of Abraham is the faith that saves us. Yeah. And we, people have to understand that. So what was the faith of Abraham? The faith of Abraham, if you read it in Romans, it's really clear that the faith of Abraham was that he believed God. And what does that mean, that he believed God? It means that God spoke to him and he believed what God said to the extent that he was persuaded to do what God said. Yeah. And that was credited to him as righteousness. The fact that he heard it, he believed it, and he acted on it, and he did what God said. That is faith. Yeah, what, what, if he, what if he hadn't obeyed it? Right. If he would, had, right. Would it have been faith? Right. Would it? No, it would not. It would not have been faith if he had not have obeyed it. And, it. and and it says in Galatians 3, I think 27 and 29, that all those who are in Christ are Abraham's seed, his descendants. And his descendants are of the same faith as Father Abraham. He's the father of the faith. And so... Everybody in Messiah has that faith. In other words, that they hear the gospel, all of it, the part where you give up your life, and they're persuaded to do it. That is belief. That's what belief is. That's what faith is. That's who Abraham was. Yeah. And his descendants were who? Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes. So therefore, in the New Covenant... If we're his descendants and we're in the new covenant, it's the new Israel, the descendants of Abraham, that produced the 12 tribes. And that's prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 49 of, of the restoration of the 12 tribes to be a light to the nations. So where is that restoration of the 12 tribes? If you go and try to find the 12 tribes of natural Israel, you can't find them because they're scattered all over the world. Yeah. And they're not united, and they don't know their identity anymore. So it's not them. So who is it? So who is it? It's the spiritual 12 tribes, the servant Israel, overcoming where they didn't for them so that, our, so that God can give to them what he promised them in the next age but we have to overcome for them. Yeah. We're the servant Israel. That's who the spiritual 12 tribes are. And that's how we relate to Abraham. Mm. And there's, 
no other faith that saves you. There's a lot of different kinds of faith. There's blind faith. There's people have faith in all kinds of things, but it's not the faith that saves you from your sins. If you could just talk about the process of how we went from being, thinking we were just part of the Jesus movement and the rest of the Christian churches to becoming 12 tribes. Because <laughs> a lot of people might think we just like went 12 places and said, okay, we're 12 tribes. But really we had no idea. Yeah. When I met, I think you might have been already here by the time I, yeah. I was here, but when I met them, they were, they were going to the first Presbyterian church. Mm-hmm. And they were faithful to be there on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And Wednesday night. Wednesday night too? Yeah. 727. So <laughs> Ben Hayden. Ben Hayden, yeah. It was the time Ben Hayden was there. And, and they were there. So we thought of ourselves, and we can say ourselves, we thought of ourselves as part of Christianity. Mm. Until some certain circumstance happened. Yeah, the circumstance was <laughs> that <clears throat> I don't know exactly which year it was, 75 or 6, I think. 76. Because um, I was gone. That they closed, they closed the church service for the Super Bowl. Sunday morning, right? On Sunday. Yeah. Because they, everybody wanted to watch the Super Bowl. And so the Super Bowl evidently was more important than them coming together to worship the Most High God. And so when they did that, we realized that we could not, we could not participate in that anymore. That's really was the defining moment, really. But wasn't it when, um, when you, you all actually went to church and found it closed? Yeah. Actually, they all had it down there, you know? Yeah. It wasn't that far from the, from mm-hmm. the line house. Yeah. It's just a few blocks down the road. Yeah, so down they go, all of them together, and they get there, and the church is closed. Mm-hmm. They go, whoa, wait a minute. You know, it says closed for Super Bowl. the Super Bowl. So on, on the big sign outside. Right. Yeah. And so then, then it became really clear that in our conscience, this is not us. And so then that was when we decided to quit going to church and that we were going to be the church. We were going to quit going to church and we were going to be the church. And so we started having our own services and we called it critical mass, which is a nuclear physics term. Yeah, it's fission. Yeah, and and, um, one of our people came up with that term and said, you know, there's going to be so much interaction of all the people that at some point it's going to heat up and it's going to create critical mass and there's going to be an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and we said, Amen! <laughs> so we call it critical mass. Yeah. So we had critical mass after that and that's when the trouble started. Mm. That's when the trouble started. When we separated ourselves from going to First Presbyterian in Chattanooga and started meeting outside in Warner Park and in the Vine House when it was raining, Hmm. that was the beginning. And we saw that our father, our father was pleased with that. And he caused us to grow from that. And we had the freedom to really worship him the way we were being led to, you know. And it wasn't like that we had one person that stood up and talked. But people would stand up and speak freely from what they were learning and hearing from our Father and what they were reading in the Bible and things that we were being taught. And there was just so much energy and, 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 and action. And people started writing songs we started learning how to do Israeli dances and 
this all came into our worship and everything just increased. And um, it was really amazing. Wow. It's totally wonderful. Wow. And that was the end of going to church. And so even after that, you were still looking for like other people that were trying to do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. So you went to like other communities. Right. And so then, so then we, so then uh, Gene and Marsha, uh, <clears throat> we sent them, and they went all over the country to groups of people that were kind of like Jesus, Jesus movement groups to try to find camaraderie. And this went on with Gene and those of us that were with him. Mm -hmm. This went on for some years of looking for, for like-mindedness, for um, the same heart, the same understanding, because we knew that there's only the, the, the whole, we knew within ourselves that the Holy Spirit could bring us into unity if we were surrendered, that there was one Spirit and he had one message for everything. And that if we found camaraderie. Yeah, if we found uh, other other people who had the same spirit, we knew that, that they would they would hear us. Right. And we would hear them. Right. They would, we would connect if it was the same spirit. That's right. right. That's right. And that we would be one. And this was our hope. And this was Jane's hope, you know, for years. Until we exhausted and then Everything we knew to find these people, even going to Europe and looking yeah. there and everywhere we, we went. Thought we, we thought we'd found such a group in Sweden. Yeah. yeah he and I actually went yeah. with Gene and Marsha to, to Sweden and we talked yeah. to the, the leaders there, but it did not go well. No. Yeah. And this is what we ran into everywhere. What, and, was, what was their main opposition? Well, they just didn't believe that you had to really live in community. They didn't see it any deeper than that. Hmm. That was mainly it. And they had other doctrinal reasons. Or like you know, give up your life. Maybe tongues or yeah. something, or something like that. Um, but yeah, they didn't, they didn't have that foundation of belief of giving up your life. They didn't have that gospel. And so we couldn't join ourselves with them. And, Usually it was them kicking us out, like, see you later, you know. Appreciate you coming, but, you know, that's what happened in Sweden. And we had to abruptly leave, you know. You know. Anyway, it's sad. It was very sad. And we saw other groups where pe the people wanted to follow us, and the leaders had that selfish ambition in them. And they were threatened. They were threatened that we came on the scene and their people were drawn to us. And they slammed the door shut on their people and rejected the authority that was in Gene Sprays. They and all he did was, he was there with us, like in a group down in Florida and several other things, several other groups like that. Where, and it was just like what Yahshua said to the Pharisees said, you don't go in and you don't allow your people to go in either. It was something like that. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. yeah. But it was the same kind of thing, you know. And really, we came to really understand, really, that it was because these people really had selfish ambition. And it's obvious because they didn't preach a gospel that slashed into and did away with selfish ambition by dying and hating that whole way of living where you're living for yourself. And so we really, we were so grieved over these kind of situations. And then we found the people in Vermont and they weren't that way. They welcomed us and they received the authority of the love that was in, that was in, in your neck and Gene Spirits. And they received him, and this created a wonderful thing for us. Yeah, when they received him, they received us. Yeah. It was just, we were all one. Yeah. And we just grew from there, you know. And I remember before we moved up to Vermont, we were still in Tennessee and Georgia and Alabama. We were in the South, and, you know, they got us all together, and, you know, we were elders, you know, kind of whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and he said, I just want to let you know, we're going up there. 
and we're not taking any kind of like position of anything but a servant and we're going out there to raise them up we're going to raise those people up wow. and so the only there was one of us that really didn't receive that because he had selfish ambition and he thought that he was being called to be an apostle to Dalton, Georgia. And he never gave that thought up about himself. Hmm. And he went physically to Vermont, but he didn't last. Hmm. He fell away because of that ambition. Hmm. It was yeah, sad to see he's that. Gone. Huh? He's gone. Yeah, he's gone. And now he's passed away. And wow. We went to his memorial in Memphis when he died. A couple of us. You know, but we saw things like this. But we got up there and we just like started coming under those brothers and pouring our lives into them. And the most miraculous thing was they were older than us. They had children that were much older than our children. They had some children that were in high school. And they were salt of the earth Vermonters. Came out of, you know, the Catholic Church, French Canadian descent you know, background and like, and what was so miraculous and here we were just these rebellious hippie types, you know, coming up out of Tennessee and like, and we just had one really good person, this missionary kid here, <laughs> but you know, it was sort of like that back okay. then. And so we go up there and they received us. They received us, they respected us and received us. And it was amazing. They received us and we were serving them. And we weren't trying to be anybody up there. And something amazing happened there. But the bond of the North and the South right there. You know? It's something it was, that's only it, grown. It was miraculous. It was like the fruit of love yeah. to bring together. Their, their children are some of our leaders. Now. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Up there in the tribe, up there in the Northeast. Wow. Their children are the ones leading the tribe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's wonderful.